And we are so excited to kick off our uh, plant-based eating program with our first event virtually and our first speaker. We feel very blessed to have Lauren Ornelas with us today. She is the founder of the Food Empowerment Project and has done a lot of really amazing work in the plant-based eating space. And we are really lucky to have her as our speaker today. Um, I would ask if you have any questions, I believe Lauren will be taking them at the end. If you could write them in the chat box, uh, that would be wonderful. So if we could all give a little silent warm welcome to Lauren, I will hand it over to her to take it away. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you everybody for being here tonight. I'm very excited and actually very honored to present. Um, I'm very excited about the initiative that Mountain View has and excited um, to, to see how this moves forward and to be a part of it in any capacity um, that myself and the organization can be. So I am going to share my screen so I can start showing the presentation. And I definitely do wanna leave time for questions. So, um, you know, I will be leaving, leaving time for that. So please ask your questions. Um, so again, I'm the founder of Food Empowerment Project. We are a vegan food justice organization. Um, we were started in 2007 and actually got our start in San Jose. Um, then we got priced out of San Jose for a while, but now we're back. Um, we just moved back to Santa Clara County um, in March of this year. So we have our office, our headquarters is in, in downtown San Jose area. And I'm just really excited to be back in the community. Um, I have been vegan since 1988. Um, I stopped eating animals uh, because I loved them, because I cared about them. And I just did not want to participate in the suffering of non-human animals. Um, at the time, you know, we already knew it was good, better for our health. We knew it was better for the environment, but we certainly don't, didn't know as much as we do now. I went vegan in high school. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of changes, uh, since 1988, I actually grew up in Texas. So, um, going vegan in Texas wasn't the easiest thing to do. Um, so moving to California, um, was an incredible experience to, uh, see how many more options there are out here. Um, so again, Food Empowerment Project is a vegan food justice organization, which means that we promote vegans for the animals, but we also advocate for farm workers, which I will talk about, farm workers who pick our food. So ensuring that by talking about veganism and by talking about, you know, for someone like me who didn't want to contribute to the suffering of non-human animals, I can't exactly eat produce or encourage other people to stop eating animals and not think about the consequences for farm workers who pick our food. We also work on the lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities. And I'll be talking a little bit about the past work we've done in Santa Clara County on this. Um, and the last part of our work, which I won't be going into, um, but I wanted to mention is our work on chocolate and trying to get people not to buy chocolate source from where slavery and child labor takes place. Um, I'll go into it a little bit towards the end, but our whole organization is based on trying to give people tools to make a difference, that how your food choices can make a difference locally and globally, and that we have a responsibility. If, if we have the luxury of eating once or twice a day, we have a responsibility for all of those in the food supply chain. And so we try to give people tools to be able to make a difference um, because when we eat like, you know, when we have these opportunities, we need to take them to try to make the world a better place. And I also just wanted to thank as well for the translation. Um, and I will uh, do my best to remember the sweet Elena who is translating all of this and try not to talk too fast. Um, Lauren, really quick, mm -hmm. sorry, mm -hmm. on that note, I'm not sure the translation is working. I just got a note that it might not be going through. Um, so if someone is on the call who is on the spin is listening to the Spanish translation, if you could confirm that it's working for everyone, that would be great. Um, let me see. Um, hmm, okay, Nancy said that she was having a hard time hearing the translation, but I, 
I'm not sure. Okay, yes, this person says I hear it in English when I select Spanish. So I apologize, everybody. We tested this before it started and it was working just fine. Um, let me see how to fix this. Um, let me see here. Mm, I'm sorry, everybody, this translation function is a new feature for me attempting to, let's see. Um, all right, well, Um, is there anybody who is listening to the Spanish interpretation on the call that can confirm or deny whether or not that function is working? How would you like them to confirm that, Sarah? Um, either in the chat or vocally, either way. Let me see, um, I can... All right, well, let me message Elena. Again, I really apologize. I thought that we figured this out before it started, but this function. Yes, uh, this will be recorded and there will be a Spanish translation um, option. Yeah, the issue is that people, Elena says, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what happened. I'm asking our translator to maybe log off and then log back on so we can start this translation function again. Uh, the interpreter can't test audio because uh, once they are in the Spanish section, they cannot say anything back in the English side of things. So we can't actually hear what Elena is saying, which is part of the problem. Um, what's the translation? Yeah, I'm wondering if the recording maybe messed up the translation function. I really apologize, everybody. We'll try to get this running in just a minute or two. Okay, Elena, admit. Okay, let's see. So add Elena as our interpreter in Spanish. Update. Okay. So Elena has been added and she has been um, relisted as the interpreter. So hopefully this time works. But in the meantime, Nancy um, just messaged me and said we can get started and they're figuring it out. So um, Lauren, please go ahead. And I really apologize for the interruption. It's totally fine. Um, language justice is very important. So it's very, very important that everybody has access. Um, so I will, maybe it's working. You really want me to just go ahead and start? She just messaged me that she's back in Spanish and it should be working. Cool. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, now I'll start rambling on again, everybody. Um, thanks again, everybody, for being here in the evening. Really appreciate your time and wanting to learn more. And again, community of Mountain View for having these. Um, so I just wanted to share with you all, Quincy, 
Um, Quincy's a duck who lives in a sanctuary. And for me, Quincy embodies the reason why we feel that people should give um, veganism um, some consideration. And that's because Quincy has a right to her own feathers without having to worry about them being turned into a coat or a comforter. She has a right to her own flesh, her own body, um, without having to worry about somebody wanting to consume her. In fact, she has a right to her own bodily, bodily autonomy um, without having to worry about somebody wanting to harm her um, for any type of exploitive or consumptive purposes. So Quincy is why we, it's very simply why we promote veganism. And I'm not gonna go through all the different things. I personally have been done, I've done investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses around the country, as well as throughout California, including foster farms, um, egg farms that, you know, uh, were healthy, you know, the brown eggs are supposed to be coming. Donde podemos agarrar huevos. Chickens being cornered by rats. Podemos... Um, the chicks still having the tips of their beaks cut off. and. I can go on about all of that, but I feel like in these times today, you kind of already know that, right? You, you have access to the videos, you know what's happening. So I'm not gonna go into that too much, um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to make sure to point out that, that veganism is better for the environment and for, the, uh, for your health, but for many of us, it's very much about not wanting to cause harm to another being. And, and where we are at in the world right now, if you have access to healthy foods, um, you don't have to contribute to the suffering of non-human animals. And when there's so much suffering going on in the world, it's amazing to find at least one way in which we cannot contribute to that suffering. So as a very proud Hikanex, meaning that I am um, Mexican, um, and I recognize my indigenous roots. Um, it was very important for me to make sure that I had the ability to one, enjoy my own comfort foods and two, be able to share with others and my community delicious foods that didn't contain the suffering of non-human animals. So we actually have a website called Vegan Mexican Food. It's in English and in Spanish, and it's just full of vegan Mexican food recipes. Um, we also, one of my former colleagues, um, she's Filipina. We did the same thing. Um, we have vegan Filipino food, um, which has recipes, uh, vegan recipes of Filipino food. The website is in English and Tagalog. And we also, one of our board members, and in fact, our first intern um, is Lao. So we actually also have vegan Lao food and it's in English and we're very close to getting um, the Lao translation. So what we try to do is we try to provide tools for people who want to try to go vegan or try different vegan options. Um, and so these are some of the tools we've created. We will be creating, um, our executive director um, is from India. So we will be having some um, delicious Indian recipes um, created for our website soon as well. Now, one of the things that, that is important that we talk about when we look at, and a lot of times what, what gets a lot of the focus when we look at consumption of animals is the birds and the land animals. And not enough attention is paid to those who live under, under the waves. Um, Food Empowerment Project has an effort um, that we call Fight for the Ocean, because basically the oceans are in such crisis right now that we need to deliberately fight for her and every creature that lives inside of the ocean. Um, we have some events coming up in August um, where we're gonna have some cooking demos, we're gonna have some speakers, um, who focus on the ocean and really just want to encourage you all to, to sign up to attend again. It's all free as well. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when we talk about animals from the ocean, um, the way that the system is that describes them doesn't even acknowledge these beings as individuals. So if you want to look at how many fish are killed or how many lobsters are killed, it's impossible to do that because they're counted by tonnage in terms of how much they weigh. And so we relegate them to being something that's not even an individual being. And you know, for an organization like ours, just the fact that beings could potentially suffer is enough to not want to cause any harm to them. But we know sometimes intelligence plays in for people to care about other beings, which you know, uh, we would like for it to not be based on that, but there have been a lot of studies talking about how intelligent 
fish are and how much they feel pain, just like lobsters do. In fact, one um, study was done, you know, there's self-awareness studies that they do for animals sometimes to see if the animals are what we would consider intelligent. Are they self-aware? So animals that have passed self-awareness tests would include like dolphins and dogs and primates, meaning that when they look in a mirror, they know who it is, they know who their reflection is, they know they're looking at themselves. And recently they did that with a fish and they put a brown mark on a fish's face and the fish could tell that this was on them. And so the fish immediately went down to the bottom of the ocean and scrubbed their face off. I shouldn't say ocean, they're probably in captivity. Um, scrubbed the mark off their face, showing that they could identify themselves. They had this type of self-awareness. And unfortunately, instead of all the studies talking about ways that we should acknowledge that they feel pain no differently than maybe animals we're more familiar with, such as dogs and cats or rabbits, um, but the study instead decided maybe we need to change this test of self-awareness because there's this inability for people to want to acknowledge that so many various animals that we exploit and harm actually do feel pain. So moving on from that, let's talk a little bit about the environment. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with environmental racism, but environmental racism, racism exists very close to home. Um, environmental racism means when one portion of the population, which tends to be black, brown, and indigenous, are more negatively impacted by pollutants than higher, more affluent, and frankly, more white communities are. And when I say this is happening close to home, all we have to do is look at East Palo Alto, right? East Palo Alto, which is right across the highway from Palo Alto, is a community riddled with environmental racism from the toxic facilities that exist there, as well as the fact that they really don't have access to even grocery stores. We have the ports in Oakland, similar situations. In Santa Clara County itself, all the toxic waste facilities were at one point in time located in brown and black and indigenous communities here. So when we look at ways in which our consumption of animals contributes to environmental racism, it's also very apparent. In North Carolina, where you have a lot of where the pigs are being killed for food in that state, you have black, brown, and indigenous communities living there who are greatly impacted by these farms. And I've investigated pig farms in North Carolina. And I can tell you, I had to shower several times just to get the smell out of my pores. The smell is something that I can't even describe to you. The colors that come out of what are called manure pits, um, sometimes they like to call them manure lagoons, which is a euphemism. But these manure pits are such colors that you don't really see in nature. They're like fluorescent colors that come out because of all the different types of chemicals and antibiotics and things that are being fed to these animals who are kept in close proximity to one another to they and give them all these types of um, uh, different additives in their feed to try to keep them healthy. And what happens is, is that you have people living in these communities who suffer from some incredibly high rates of respiratory disease, they suffer from headaches, they suffer from nosebleeds. Something as simple as having their windows open in the summertime is impossible because the flies are so bad. And all of this is because the pig farms that are in these communities. And when you have hurricanes that hit, I mean, we'll hear it, right? We, you, you listen and you, you, after the hurricanes hit these areas where the, the rivers are overflowing because these manure pits are overflowing and all this waste is now going into the rivers. You have bloated and dead pigs floating in the rivers. So all of this is impacting the communities and you have one added thing happening to people in these communities. And that's that their property values are pretty much worthless because nobody wants to live near these facilities. Now in California, this is actually a photo of California, one of a dairy farm in California, um, where we have dairy farms in California. Now, again, we are the number one dairy producing state. We have some dairy farms that have over 17,000 cows on them. One dairy cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure a day. That's one cow, 120 pounds of wet manure a day times 
17,000 for some of these facilities. Now, a lot of the smaller farms may only have 200 cows or 30 cows. That's still a tremendous amount of waste being burdened because there's no sewer treatments, right? There's no municipal treatment facility going from these. So this is going into our air, it's going into our soil, it's going into our waterways. And here in California, the vast majority of the, the all the large dairy farms are located in the Central Valley, which is predominantly where the Latinx community lives. So the Latinx community in these areas has some of the highest rates of asthma in the country. So, you know, when we talk about the environmental impact of um, animal consumption, you know, it's easy enough to say you have to, you know, put water into the crops that grow to feed the animals, then you have to give the animals water, then you have to, in the slaughter process, there's a lot of water that goes into that too. But more importantly is the form of environmental racism that takes place for animal consumption. And the fact that not only are we harming non-human animals, not only are we harming our health, we are harming already vulnerable community members. We're impacting their health, we're impacting their children, and we're impacting their way of life. So again, as I mentioned before, you know, we're an organization that wants to talk about what happens to non-human animals, but we also want to be cognizant of our food choices and how they impact farm workers. So farm workers in the country are some of the most abused workers that exist in this country and even to some extent abroad. The average lifespan of a farm worker is 49 years old. So I'm 51, I've already surpassed the average lifespan of a farm worker. And this is because of the living conditions in which they live, this is their working conditions, this is everything they go through on a daily basis. So you have many farm workers who um, are forced to work in conditions like this, which hurts their back. Um, they are exposed to agricultural chemicals. Um, which impacts for the women, it impacts the children that they have. That's why many children of farm workers um, are often born with different types of learning disabilities because of these agricultural chemicals. You also have that many farm workers um, experience homelessness. Many of them live in cardboard boxes, they live in pickup trucks, they live along the rivers. Um, <clears throat> these are people who are putting food on our plate every single day. And this is how they are treated. Um, they sacrifice everything that they do for their children to have a good education and for their children to succeed and, in fact, to have a better life than they do. We have, you know, farm workers who are regularly sexually harassed. This is, um, you know, UC Berkeley did a whole study on how rampant sexual harassment is in the fields. But let's take a look at where we're at now, right? Let's take a look at what's happened during COVID. So let's look at Sonoma County, which is where the wine industry is very, um, uh, I guess, uh, affluent and influential, I will say. Um, so you have here, when we look at the COVID rates, right? We look at the COVID rates for a community like Sonoma County, and we just moved from there. So I'm, I'm picking on them intentionally. Um, but you had the Latino community there having 76% COVID diagnosis, when only 27.2% of the population is even Latinx. You had 78% of that community having zero underlying conditions and still getting COVID. So look at, let's look at some of the reasons why farm workers might be more susceptible, right? Many of them travel to work together because not all of them can afford, afford to own a car. Some of them take buses to get to work. The wineries themselves were housing farm workers in dorm rooms, in bunk beds during COVID, right? You also have the fact, and this is um, no surprise to many of us, that farm workers, especially during the previous federal administration, but not let off the hook in the current one, are victims of racism and discrimination, threats with deportation and fear. And those are not types of things that are gonna come up in a blood test. They're not gonna be things that you can say, oh, they have type two diabetes, they're at a higher risk. 
These are things in lived experience by people which makes their stress levels go up, which makes their immune systems go down. You also have um, the fires that occur in that community. So many of you may not know this, but in Sonoma County um, and places in Southern California, many of the farm workers during the fires were forced to work in mandatory evacuation zones. So that means that the county health department deemed, or the, the county in general deemed that portions of where the fire were, were so dangerous that people needed to move from those locations so that they didn't get impacted by the fires. But yet they found loopholes in which to make farm workers work in these communities, in, in these areas where the fires were so devastating. We're talking about a way again that workers themselves are seen as not human. That people say, I can't do that type of work like a farm worker does as if somehow farm workers are superhuman when in fact it's that farm workers are willing to sacrifice their health for their families. Farm workers are willing to sacrifice everything for their families to have a better life. So they work in areas like mandatory evacuation zones because the wineries who might be getting federal funding are not passing on that funding down to the farm workers when they're unable to work. And right now we are again entering, fire season is kind of year round, but again, right now workers, farm workers throughout California, again, might be placed in areas where they are, um, is not good for their health. And they're forced to work um, in very, you know, smoky conditions as we even saw in Santa Clara County last year. So one of the things that we were able to change, um, and it's just important to try to show some of the barriers that exist for farm workers, is that um, there is a regulation in California that require farm workers living in labor camps. Now we do have labor camps in California. There are some in the, um, the Salinas, Monterey and Watsonville area. One is called Buena Vista. Um, it's in Watsonville. So we have labor camps in California and the labor camps um, were requiring farm workers to relocate when the picking season was over and move 50 miles away from that labor camp so that they would be eligible to move back into the labor camp when the picking season started again. So in the Buena Vista labor camp, we had farm worker children who weren't able to move into the labor camps um, with their families until May. And they were forced to move out of the labor camps in November when the picking season ended, which meant that these children were only able to be in school for a very short amount of time. So in the woman that we worked with in the area, in 20 years, she only saw one farm worker student graduate from high school. There are deliberate barriers being placed in farm worker communities to prevent their children from succeeding. And this is happening in our backyards, right? And these are things that we need to be more aware of as policymakers, as consumers, to try to figure out ways to stop some of these barriers for existing. Now, farm workers just finally got overtime pay in the state of California a couple years ago, but it had been vetoed under a previous administration in California to provide them with overtime. And there's lots more barriers that exist, including, including just the lack of enforcement. So in terms of like, what can we do? What can we do to help farm workers? One of the things we strongly believe in is listening to farm workers themselves and what are they asking us to do? So the San Quintin farm workers in Mexico are asking us to boycott Driscoll's berries because Driscoll's Berries is not respecting farm worker justice. They are, they are, they're suffering from something called wage theft. And that's a whole nother complicated thing, but it just basically means that the, the go-between person um, is taking their wages. So maybe the, the grower is paying a contractor and that contractor isn't then giving the money to the workers. And the, and the grower is saying, sorry, it's not our fault. We gave it to the contractor. So a lot of blame gets put on contractors instead of holding people responsible. Um, we also have the Coalition of Immokalee Workers asking people to please boycott Wendy's. 
Now, Wendy's has refused for a very long time now to sign the fair food program with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And one of the things they're asking for is simply one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. One penny more per pound sounds like nothing, right? But the irony of this is that Wendy's is not willing to pay it. And also that the Coalition of Immokalee Workers have found that one more penny per pound makes an incredible difference in the lives of farm workers. And that's why they're demanding it. So we want to make sure that when we talk about using our individual choices and making these decisions to what Food Empowerment Project calls eating our ethics, to make sure that if we don't believe in cruelty to animals, that we don't participate in systems that harm them, if we don't believe in, in harming the rights of farm workers or in injustices that are taking place against them, that we don't then support those injustices, but that we don't just make these decisions in our own kitchen or when we go grocery shopping, but we let the powers that be know why. So if you go into a grocery store that sells Driscoll's berries, you ask them to sell something other than Driscoll's berries because there's a boycott being called by farm workers who, who are demanding justice. That you tell Wendy's why you are not buying from them anymore because you want them to sign the fair food program. Because we can't change all of this just through our individual choices. Our collective voices have power and we must act on them because communities locally and globally are counting on us to do this because we are in a more privileged place. And if anybody's watching this uh, online, you are probably one of those people that is lucky to have even access to the internet at this point in time. Um, so from here, uh, I just want to talk to you about one of the things that Food Empowerment Project does, and that is that we have a school supply drive for the children of farm workers every year. And we've been very lucky of the support that we've gotten in Santa Clara County for this. Um, in fact, um, at that time, city council member, but now assembly member Ash Calra's office has always been incredibly supporting uh, putting drop off locations um, in city hall in um, the assembly members offices, but we do the school supply drive. We don't see this as an act of charity. We see this as a way to right an injustice that's taking place against farm workers. We believe and we want everybody pushing for policy changes, regulatory changes, legislative changes, but right now immediately we have children who are in need. We have parents who are sacrificing so much for them to succeed and we need to help a little bit if we can. Again, unless you grow all your own food, you have a farm worker to thank for what you're eating. So we do this school supply drive every year. I can never, I always wanna show a little girl and a little boy. These are actually photos from Watsonville, um, which is where our very big farm worker community that we work with is. Um, this year, the school supplies are gonna be going to indigenous farm workers. So we have a lot of indigenous farm workers who are from um, indigenous to Mexico and Oaxaca, in fact, where they still speak the, their indigenous languages. So these farm workers are at more of an injustice. Uh, I, I, I should say they're more at a, a place of being uh, discriminated against because when things like COVID happen, when things like the fires happen, they don't speak English or Spanish. They only speak their indigenous languages and no warning systems are given to them in their indigenous languages. So they have additional barriers. So we always make sure to do our school supply drive to, to, to help those children. Now, lucky for you, we are actually in the midst of our school supply drive for the children of farm workers right now. Unfortunately, our deadline was June 30th, but we did not raise enough money or receive enough backpacks for the school supply drive so far this year. So we have extended it to July 19th. We um, have information on our website. Um, sorry for doing a push. It just happens to be part of the time, but basically we're just trying to get a thousand backpacks filled with school supplies for kids. We have a dream, although we're kind of far from that dream right now, but our dream was to also get reusable water bottles for the kids. And the reason why, if any of you are parents, you probably know that the water fountains aren't, being, aren't working in schools right now. So we have farm worker children who don't have access to reusable water bottles. Once they get to school, they don't have any water to drink at all. So we are trying to get maybe water bottles for the kids um, so that they have them for the school year. And we have two groups of families 
in the Central Valley, we're working with one group of families in Watsonville, Monterey area, and a group of families in um, Sonoma County, a total of a thousand um, children we're trying to get school supplies to. So I'm just gonna take a quick sip of water, sorry y'all. And y'all can tell I'm from Texas because I keep saying y'all. Um, so I'm going to go now into the lack of access to healthy foods, um, because as well, let me just start with this and then I'll show you an image to reflect what I mean. Lack of access to healthy foods in the United States is a big, very big problem, which primarily impacts black, brown and indigenous people. But you can always add on the Appalachian area, right? We're talking about very poor white people in the Appalachia, but for the most part, it's, it's black, brown, and indigenous community members who experience the lack of access to healthy food. Now, I've spoken about this issue abroad. It's the same with the First Nations people in Canada. It's the same thing with the Māori in New Zealand. It's the same with the Aborigines in Australia. And it's the same thing with immigrants in countries such as, as England, where you have black and brown indigenous or immigrant communities who are the most impacted by lack of access to healthy food. Now, as I mentioned, Food Empowerment Project is a vegan organization. We would love everybody to be able to go vegan for the sake of the animals, for the sake of their health. But the problem is, is that we know not everybody has access to healthy foods to be able to go vegan. And this is a problem in Santa Clara County. This is a very big problem here. So you have, if you can see this picture here, this is actually a photo that I took in Vallejo, which is a community we're currently working in. But it shows you what some of the problems are. This is a gas station that is doing their best. They're trying to provide produce in a community that doesn't have access to it. There's some potatoes here, there's some apples, there's some onions, and there's a few bananas. I'll tell you, when I surveyed in Santa Clara County, we didn't even have prices on our foods. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And if I forget, remind me. But this is the reality for many people living in our community is that they don't even have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So the idea of going vegan or going plant-based for their sake, the environment, the animals, for whatever the various reasons why it's good is difficult, if not impossible. So in Santa Clara County, um, we were all volunteer at the time. Um, we went out and we created a survey tool um, to reflect our community. So um, our community being at the time, and I know it's different now, but at the time that we did this, the majority of the um, brown community members living here were Latinx. So we had our survey tool, which you can see here, hopefully you can see it clearly. Um, but we had a survey tool, which we included um, uh, a lot of foods purchased by the Latinx community in Vallejo, in the community we've also worked in, we had to add in more for the black community, as well for the Filipinx community. We're now working in Pittsburgh, California, where we had to do the same because we want to make sure that our survey tools are culturally appropriate for people who live in that community to be able to access the healthy foods that they want. So we use this survey tool. This is the exact survey tool that we used in Santa Clara County. It was about 14 pages long. And we surveyed for fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, meat and dairy alternatives, as well as had a variety of other questions. So you can see here, we asked for organic or non-organic. We asked for quantity. And the reason why we asked for quantity is because if you're trying to feed your family and there's only one stock of broccoli, you may not be able to feed your entire family. So we wanted to make sure we got the quantity in there because we know that some gas stations and liquor stores are trying to have some produce out there to try to help the community. So in 2010, we put out our findings. Um, where again, what we did when we did the report for Santa Clara County differently in Vallejo and in Pittsburgh, we only looked at the cities, but for the county, we compared high income areas and low income areas in Santa Clara County. And what we were able to prove was no shock, which was that the, the um, lower income non-white communities had little access to fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, um, canned, frozen, you name it, had less access. So what we had here 
was we had almost the organic was almost non-existent in Santa Clara County. In fact, we had frozen vegetables was pretty much like double. Like the high income areas had so much more than the lower browner black communities in Santa Clara County. Because what we had in our communities was frozen pizza, ice cream, and foods like that. Whereas in the higher income areas in Santa Clara County, you had your frozen vegetables. We just didn't have those in our communities. What we also found was that as I showed you in this image, there are prices here. In Santa Clara County, there were no prices on these foods. So maybe if you've ever gone into a convenience store and you're at the cash register and you pay and you maybe see a little basket there of bananas or other type of produce, there were no prices there, which meant that the person behind the counter could decide how much they wanted to charge that individual for the food. So it could be different for one person than the next, which is ripe for discrimination. You also had the fact that without prices, people who don't speak English were at an automatic disadvantage from finding out the price. Now we had the same problem when it comes to the canned items weren't always priced either. We try to look into it and talk about ways to change it, but this is a policy, this is a policy that exists in California where not all food has to be priced. And it was something at that time larger than our organization could take on, but it is a problem that exists here in the county. Now, we also surveyed for meat and dairy alternatives. And obviously you've heard me say, one of the reasons for that is because we don't want harm to come to non-human animals. But we also know that it's important for people to have alternatives. We know that diets higher in fruits and vegetables is much better for your health. And so having these alternatives is important. But equally important is the fact that many black, brown and indigenous people are what Food Empowerment Project calls lactose normal. We call us lactose normal because many of us can't digest the milk of another species, which in and of itself is weird that people are consuming milk of another species. But some of us, and I will speak specifically to my ancestors, um, Columbus brought cows over on, the, on his second voyage. Cows were not indigenous to the Americas. So my indigenous roots, why won't I, I can't consume, it's a form of colonization. Dairy for us is a form of, of colonization, right? So it's a problem when you have the fact that the foods like cow's milk, which is what's available in the vast majority of grocery stores, and convenience stores in, in Santa Clara County is available, but plant-based milks aren't. Because having your kids, having your family, having yourself have to go to work or go to school with stomach aches is a problem. Dairy is a legacy of colonization. And it's important that we look at it and we phrase it this way because it is another form of discrimination that's taking place and why it's so important that we survey and we talk about dairy for a lot of us being a form of a product of colonization and, and why we need to stop not making people feel bad for being intolerant as if there's something wrong with us when our ancestors didn't consume it to begin with. And so it's really important that as we are, as the city is trying to talk about getting people to become plant-based, we need to make sure that these alternatives exist in the community. And we'd be happy to help with that. One of the other issues we found in doing the work here in Santa Clara was something called NAICS. And this is a voluntary system where grocery stores, liquor stores, convenience stores, can identify themselves voluntarily as to what they are. So I lived and I worked in downtown San Jose and I had two liquor stores across the street from each other where I lived and where I worked. And how this is possible is because some of them are categorizing themselves as grocery stores. So when we looked at the, the, the if you look at the left-hand summary A, that one shows you how the government is looking at the amount of, of high income and, and lower income in Santa Clara County. And it looks like 
our county is doing pretty good when it comes to grocery stores and having access to fresh produce. But the reality when we physically went into these locations is summary B, that it was not equal, that there was a very big gap between the access to healthy foods in grocery stores um, versus those that were actually convenience stores and liquor stores. And again, ironically, at the time, Sam Licardo um, was a city council member in San Jose. He's now the mayor here. We did have a conversation with him about that. And again, some of these issues, this in fact is a federal issue. And again, we'd love any policymakers to help out with that. Um, but these are some of the barriers that exist. I mean, I don't know how to, you know, when we surveyed in Santa Clara County and we went into a liquor store in um, San Jose, in East San Jose, there would be the only produce we would find would be limes next to the alcohol. When we went into Palo Alto and we surveyed their liquor stores, the only thing we found was liquor, right? Because the liquor store didn't need to try to have the fresh fruits and fresh vegetables because they had plenty of grocery stores available. Um, and we can even talk about the food when you compare Palo Alto and San Jose. Um, and that's very frightening to what the school kids are eating as well. So what we did after we came out with this report, we shared it with all policymakers and we shared it with community organizations. But what we did then a few years later is we did focus groups in the community. And I will tell you all of our focus groups were done in San Jose because that was the most impacted area. Um, but we did them all because we find out too many times well-intentioned NGOs, government officials um, don't listen to the community. They don't talk to the community. They make decisions for the community. So they may think bringing Walmart in is a great idea to increase access to healthy foods, or they think let's bring in a farmer's market and they don't talk to the community. They don't have it in various languages for the community. They don't have the farmer's market taking place at a time when the community wants it. They aren't making sure that the people who are there are selling the types of food that the community wants or needs. So sometimes these fail and they blame the community instead of asking the community first and foremost, what the barriers that they exist and what are some of the solutions. So that's what we did. All of our focus groups were conducted in Spanish. All of these reports are available on our website in English and in Spanish. Um, so we put out our report and what we found was that a lot of the people in the community, it wasn't even as much access to the healthy foods as it was the cost of the healthy foods. The food was just too expensive for them. And that's why we began pushing for living wages. And Santa Clara County is definitely, has made great strides in that area. Um, but there's always more that needs to and can be done. But living wages is an incredible way to create some equity in a system that was not created to have it. Our food system was never made to benefit black and brown and indigenous people, right? It was made to benefit off of us. So we need to create some equity by having living wages. We also found that a lot of people who were immigrants ate healthier in the communities that they lived in than when they moved to the area. And the reason why is because they were able to grow some of their own foods. And when they moved here, instead of being able to buy fresh tomatoes, they were being forced to buy things like tomato sauce. And they didn't want to have to make their foods with tomato sauce. So I'm telling you these examples, and I'll let you know that this is these two points, which were the, the biggest points that came out of our focus groups, are the exact same points that came out of seven focus groups we did in Vallejo alone. So Vallejo, where we did this same work, these are the exact same two points. So even though this is San Jose, this is indicative of showing maybe some of the issues that exist in our communities. We also found that a lot of the kids in these communities were vegan um, and they wanted to have alternatives. And again, a lot of members of the community were what we would call lactose normal and needed to have these alternatives. Now, I just wanted to share, I mentioned Vallejo, and these are some of the statistics we found. Every time we do this work, we learn a little bit more. And so we just simply looked at Vallejo. And again, we were able to find more about the prevalence of liquor stores in the community. 
um, in the higher income areas and then compared to the lower income areas. And again, finding that people in the lower income areas or the districts were relying on convenience stores, gas stations, and liquor stores um, to get their food. One of the other things I just wanna mention before I wrap up, and I don't know if this issue has happened in our community. I feel like it has because I know of a space in San Jose, but that's the Safeway grocery store. And all grocery stores do this. It's not just Safeway, but it's the one that we have found that has done a lot to damage the Bay Area. And that's that Safeway has what's called restrictive deeds that they place on their former properties. And what they did in Vallejo, which was in a downtown area where black and brown community members were living and also where a senior living facility was located in downtown, they closed up their location and they moved miles away. And they placed what's called a restrictive deed on that space, which said no grocery store can move into this space for 15 years, depriving that community from having access to a grocery store. The next closest grocery store was miles away. There were teenagers who never knew what it was like to have a grocery store in their community until that 15 years was up and a grocery outlet moved in. I don't know if these exist in the city of Mountain View. It would be good to find out and it would be very important for the city council of Mountain View to pass an ordinance, which has been passed in communities such as Washington, DC, to prevent Safeway from doing this. They have done this throughout the country. So all of this information and way more is on our website, foodispower.org, which is available in English and in Spanish. Um, and I wanna say this quickly, things that you can do, because I wanna make sure this is also about empowering us with our food choices to make a difference. So if you have access to healthy foods and you don't wanna hurt animals, going vegan is a great way to do it. Shop with care, try not to support companies that violate human rights and animal rights. Lend your voices to the needs of farm workers. We're gonna be sharing a, a petition soon um, being launched in Sonoma County for the farm workers there in the wine industry. Um, try to buy organic when you can. It doesn't mean that farm workers are treated any better, but it's one less bad thing to happen to them to not being doused with agricultural chemicals. Choose ethical chocolate again. Um, if you have questions about that, I can answer. We have a list of chocolates we do and don't recommend, as well as a free app that you can download um, that talks about chocolates that don't source from where slavery and child labor is taking place or is, is the most prevalent. Um, try to avoid buying um, single-use plastic water bottles for the sake of our oceans, as well as bringing your own reusables. Try to support the farmers markets. We, we are so blessed in Santa Clara County to have so many farmers markets. It was not that way in other places I've lived. And always try to support black and brown farmers because they have additional barriers that have existed to them to, to be where they are. Um, support living wages. Um, we have more information on our website on bananas and coffee and wine. Um, speak out about these issues. A lot of people don't know about it. It's important for us to talk about them. Talk to when you go grocery shopping, any store that you go to, start talking about these issues. Make sure they know it matters to you. Get involved. We have information on our website. We have a monthly new e-newsletter you can um, get involved with. And again, share any of this. We have all of this information. And I know every time I give this talk, I worry about people being completely and utterly overwhelmed. And I always just want to take the time to remind you that I want you to feel empowered and look at these as opportunities to help make a difference for you to eat your ethics, but also help others um, who, who need and who have a right to thrive and live happy, healthy lives, um, that you have an opportunity to, to, to make sure that that happens. And again, I wanna leave time for Q&A, so I'm gonna stop here and thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, your presentation was amazing. If anybody has questions, if they could please put them in the chat, that would be awesome. Thank you. And thanks for um, Jen for boycotting Driscoll's. And I'm really glad you like lactose normal. Um, it was something we were trying to, to think of a way to kind of 
because it, it is, it's called lactose intolerant for many of us who, you know, are black or brown or indigenous. It's like, it's hard to feel like there's an implication that there's something wrong with us. When, if you look historically at it, um, it's just a, a part of um, another way that colonization impact us and our people. Thanks everybody. I'm happy to answer any questions. Anything you think might be controversial, I'm happy to answer. I've been doing this a long time and I just really rather you feel like any burning questions that you have that I can answer and not to feel. Okay, so chocolate that we recommend. Um, really you should check out our list. Um, I will say that the vast majority of the big chocolate brands do source from areas where child labor and slavery is the most prevalent. Um, if you go, if you download our app, you can even type in the names of the companies. Um, they have to make at least one vegan chocolate to make our list, but honestly, most companies do. I will say that some of the biggest brands that you've probably heard of that we do recommend would be, um, oh, I can put this here. Sorry, I'm trying to read the comments and then this. Um, uh, Newman's Own, they have been incredible. Every time we check in on them about their sourcing, they get back to us right away. Um, Justin's Peanut Butter Cups, we recommend them. Um, I'm trying to think of who else is another big company that we recommend. Um, we don't recommend Hershey's, Nestle's, Mars. Um, we don't recommend any of those companies because they are sourcing from those areas. The link and the app is free to download. It's free for the iPhone or the Android. Oh, I'm hosting an event with a Los Angeles Mexican vegan restaurant. How do you recommend? Um, Maybe you want to email me. I'll put my email in here. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't know how to put my email in here, but I'll put my email in here for everybody. Um, I think that in terms of reaching out to, um, I, I don't know if you're wanting to reach out to the Latinx community, um, but I would say that the Mexican restaurant should probably be doing the outreach from LA if that's who you're trying to reach out to. Just a quick answer to that, if that helps. Cool, thank you. Mm. Let's see, what else? What else would be helpful for y'all? Nothing? I could talk to you about my investigations of factory farms. More than anything, just a reminder about how important it is um, that you you care and you showing up tonight was proving that. So, Sarah, do you have any questions? Yeah, I was actually just thinking of one. Um, I have been hearing a lot about avocados lately and how they can be maybe not ethical in the way that we're purchasing them or who we're purchasing them from. And I was curious maybe what some of your thoughts or if you have any advice on that topic or that food. Yeah, it's definitely on our list of um, things to, to expand on our website. Avocados is on my list. Um, we're slowly going through some of these other foods now and adding new sections to our website. Um, what I try to do now is that we don't know that every farm in California is okay. But what we do know when we're trying to um, listen to farm workers is that we would never call a boycott of a company unless farm workers asked for it, right? Or, or supported one without them. So at this point in time, we have to therefore assume that the avocados being grown in California and in the United States are okay. Doesn't mean that we, ha we have no boycott, right? What I have heard is that a lot of the concerns about the avocados coming from outside of the United States. Now, again, we haven't done our research, so I'm just giving you my preliminary feedback um, that unless we heard of bad things happening um, with the avocados here in the US, we would assume that it's okay to buy them. And thank you, Catherine, for donating. Super, super, super appreciate it. Um, the suggestions. So transitioning, you know, one of the things that, you know, is talked about is like, what is the best thing to give up first? 
if you're going to trans transition to being vegan or plant-based. Um, and my personal opinion is for you to do whatever is easier for you. Because I feel like whatever you're going to be successful at is what's most important. So if you think that, you know what, I never really liked um, hot dogs, I'm not going to eat them anymore. Or I'm not going to, you know, give up one animal at a time. Um, but I would start out with whatever's easiest so you feel like a success and you know you can do it because you can do it, right? There's so many resources out there. We are happy to help you. I'm always happy to help people in any capacity that I have. I know that sometimes the biggest barrier is, is family sometimes and is how do you talk to this issue with other people? And I feel like with that one is just a matter of respect. I think that when you're making this decision for compassion, for your health, for the environment, for any reason, you have nothing but pride. You have every right to be proud of your decision and in just encourage, and anybody you're around should be respecting that decision. Um, and um, just be fair to yourself and also don't, um, don't be hard on yourself and also don't be hard on other people, right? If they're not treating you right, that's one thing. But if they're not there yet, you know, all you can do is lead by example and be the best example you can be. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that is just my thought on that. Um, so about, uh, wow, oh, right. Yes, the 12,700 deaths due to livestock industry. Yes, that came out very recently. We, we promoted that um, on our social media because at the time there was a, a big belief that there was no environmental racism and there's just more proof that it does exist. I mean, I think that, um, what the city can do to move away from industrial animal agriculture is to, if I was a city council member and I wanted people to go more plant-based, I would be doing more events where they can try plant-based options. Um, and they could, um, and again, organizations like us are happy to help um, and encourage restaurants to do it, maybe um, have some type of event where, um, you know, some, some organizations have done it like a month where you go and you eat at the restaurants and the restaurants promote um, the plant-based options, the vegan options that they have. And people who buy the vegan options get like a 10% discount or something like that. So I think that the way the city could do it is by going positive and positively putting forward the benefits of a vegan and plant-based eating and trying to work on making those alternatives more available and more abundant. Um, let's see, what's the name of the thing that's safe? Okay, so what Safeway did is they've done two different things. One is, and I, keep in mind y'all, I'm not an attorney and I'm not a, a real estate agent, but there's restrictive deeds and restrictive covenants. I'm unclear if they're the same thing, but they have done both of them. So the restrictive deed is what they did in Vallejo where they basically said in when in the sale said whoever buys this cannot turn it into a grocery store for 15 years now in willing and I'm sorry in Bellingham Washington state they have one but it's a lease saying no grocery store can move in this in this space for 20 years and that is a primarily farm worker community that they're doing that. And it's always a, an a, a attempt to harm, right? Communities who they believe have no power and have no voice. And that's why it's important that we take a stand against corporations for doing such as these. Um, we do have a, uh, what was written by um, a city council member in Washington, DC to help cities and communities pass, um, pass ordinance to prevent grocery. Again, it's not just Safeway, but they are pr predominant in our community from doing these kinds of things. Um, yep, Mike says meat's probably the best thing to give up. Some people say chickens are, some people say dairy is um, because of the excruciating pain that's inflicted upon um, the mother cows when they have their babies taken away from them. I have video footage of a mom and a baby in a very, very small dairy um, crying back and forth to each other when they were separated. Um, and the cry of the baby calf is excruciating. It, she, she sounds like a baby. She doesn't sound like um, a cow at all um, crying. So yeah, I think that there's, there's different ways of looking at it. 
Let's see, Ava's Downtown Market in Downtown Mountain View has tons of vegan options, alternatives. That's great. I'll have to check that out. Um, does water ever come in cartons? It does. Um, and I told, gosh, thank you for bringing up the kids thing. Totally know that. There are, there is water in cartons. Um, and uh, when you're talking about communities that maybe don't have um, access to a lot of money, I think is when it becomes hard um, uh, to talk about alternatives to plastic water bottles. So I, I, that's why we try to say avoid single use as much as possible because we wanna try to be as realistic as we can. We know it's not, if you're a farm worker and that's what somebody's given out to you, you gotta do what you gotta do. But we gotta try to think of other ways, but cartons are available, but they don't seem to be in the tiny ones. And I think they're probably more expensive. Yes, um, the true cost of meat is much higher than subsidized cost. Yep, that's why it's cheaper for families sometimes to buy burgers at McDonald's than it is for them to buy broccoli at a grocery store. And if y'all didn't see, Jen said that Avis is willing to try new vegan products if people will ask. Cartons can be used for school projects, though. Oh, that's a good point. Yep, the planting the seeds. That's great, too, Mary Alice. Totally. If we had any questions in Spanish, too, I want to make sure. Yeah, Nancy or Elena, if there's anything um, in Spanish, we would love to hear that as well. Okay, well, I don't see any chats, um, but I do just wanna say, um, Elena says no questions. Great. Um, I do just want to say thank you so much, Lauren. Your presentation was wonderful. I think we all learned a lot and it was the perfect start to kick off our plant-based seeding program. Um, and I think you gave us a lot to chew on. Um, and I really appreciate you being here today and um, it was wonderful. So thank you again. Thank you. And please know that we're here to help the city. We're here to help any of you, anything. We are just so excited to be back here and I'm really looking forward to working with you all more individually or as organizations to whatever capacity. It looks like we had one more question okay. like right before we go and then we'll wrap it up from Jackie. Honey, thank you for asking that question. Um, honey is not vegan, um, period. Um, again, uh, and I know for some of you that might be like, what, now she wants us to care about insects. I do actually want you to care about insects. Um, but I think that for, again, the potential to cause harm to any living being is what veganism is about. So the intention is to not cause harm. And I've seen that too, that some vegans uh, say that they consume honey. Honey is still coming from an animal. I've known people in San Jose who have like backyard beekeeping and they will admit to me in full honesty, when I pull this open, there's no way I can tell you I won't accidentally rip off one of their wings. And that's enough for somebody like me to say, I don't wanna to contribute to harming anybody. Um, and so that's why I don't think that it's, um, is, is vegan to consume honey is because it still can cause harm even if it's unintentional. Great, so thank you so much. And um, we will be accessing this recording and I know Elena, or not Elena, excuse me, Lauren put her email in the chat. If you guys want to be in contact with her, I'm sure she would be open to that. So thank you again and thank you all for attending and please keep an eye out for the next events that we're going to have. Uh, we're working on planning some really cool things coming up in the future. So keep an eye on our newsletter if you are able, um, and we will see you guys soon. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night.